The Cultured Meat Symposium, or CMS-19, is taking place in San Francisco on November 14th and 15th. The programming focuses exclusively on cell-cultured meat technology. Learn more and register at www.cms19.com. Use coupon code FUTUREFOODSHOW for a special discount. Thanks for joining us on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. We're excited to have Ingrid Newkirk on this episode. Ingrid Newkirk is the president and founder of People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, better known as PETA. She is the subject of the HBO documentary, I Am an Animal, and has written eight books about helping animals, including Making Kind Choices and the PETA Practical Guide to Animal Rights. Her new book, Animal Kind, is due out in January 2020. Her work for animal rights has made headlines around the world. Ingrid, I'd like to welcome you to the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. Thank you, Alex. Delighted that you're having the show. PETA certainly needs no introduction. Uh, however, tell us about your background and the early days of PETA. Well, I grew up, like many people, really caring about animals. I love the dog who was there before I was born. So when I was born, I had a brother dog. And although we loved animals, I'm 70, so we're going back a bit. My family ate them, we wore them. I had a fur coat when I was 19. And I just thought you shouldn't do something like hit an animal or beat them or set fire to them or do something like that but I didn't connect the dots. And there wasn't an animal rights movement to help me connect those dots. But later I took a number of jobs. I was a law enforcement officer, a deputy sheriff, and I was a cruelty investigations officer for a humane society. And I started to see inside places most people never set foot in. And by that, I mean, a slaughterhouse for chickens, which was just hideous, obviously, a farm where a pig had been left to starve when people moved out, steel traps, which kids had set behind a 7-Eleven to catch whoever wandered that way, and a fox and a squirrel did wander that way and got caught. And so I began to think more about whether or not I was showing my affection and respect for animals, and I started to change habits. And that led me to think, well, if I grew up being a, quote, animal lover, and yet was doing these things without thinking, maybe what we should do is start a little group and show people what they can eat instead of animals, what they can wear instead of leather shoes and so on, um, what they can buy to wash their hair or clean their oven that isn't tested on animals, entertainments they can use, alternatives to dissection. So Peter was born and we started to do the homework for people so that it would become easy to make changes. I wrote a book called Making Kind Choices and that really is what it's all about. You see what you don't want to support if you see it, and then you learn what else you can do so that you don't have to support it. And then you are a kind person. The Silver Spring Monkeys, I guess that investigation that was released by PETA, would you say that that is what kind of took it viral? The Silver Spring Monkeys case, so we went into this warehouse in Silver Spring, Maryland, and found all these monkeys kept in tiny, rusty, filthy cages, which had broken wires. And we found a garbage can full of the gangrened bodies of monkeys. And we busted it. We went to the police and got the experimenter arrested for cruelty to animals. That did put us on the front page of the Washington Post and it really put the whole business of animal experimentation in people's minds. I think before that, they had thought, there's nothing I can do, science is sacred, maybe it's saving babies' lives, and we just ripped the lid off it. And that went across the world, the news of that raid, and people started to write to us to say, 
this is great. What can I do? And, and those are the magic words. We'll jump into a discussion about food in, in just a second, but it would be great to chat about the terminology animal welfare versus animal rights. What's the difference? Well, animal welfare traditionally has meant being kinder, not totally kind, but kinder to animals within the context of using them for human interests, human amusements like the rodeo and the circus and so on. Um, and human needs back in survivalist times, you know, when people would kill animals so they could eat them because they didn't have anything else or they would wear their skins because they didn't have anything else. But animal welfare should be incorporated into the idea of animal rights. Animal rights says we are one animal among many. We need to get over ourselves. We're not gods. The other animals aren't trash. We're all in this together. It's the great orchestra of life, if you like. And we should be respectful of other cultures because that's what animals are. There are other tribes, other cultures. And just as we might not understand um, you know, other religions or other nationalities or other human cultures, we can't just assume, because it isn't true, that the other animals don't have language or they can't communicate or they're stupid. Those are the things that used to be said of women, of blacks, of immigrants. Um, no, we're all in this together and everyone, every living being has intelligence, has emotions, has interests, has feelings. And we say animal rights means respect them and use the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I like the, the term you used, survivalist times. Um, and, and we really are beyond survivalist times now. So I do like that term. There are many different industries where animals are used and abused. And when we think about our food system, why do you think animals are still part of that equation today? I believe there are so many reasons. One, of course, is most people, at least in times gone by, have grown up eating animals, drinking milk, and so on. And they've had a lot of propaganda along the way because there's mega advertising and government subsidies telling you that, that you'll be strong and your bones will be in good shape and so on if you eat these horrible things. So we've, many of us grown up and we've acquired the taste for it and human beings don't like to change. You know, people say, uh, don't show me, I don't want to give up whatever it is. And that means subconsciously at least, they know if they actually see the process, they're probably not going to want to cling to that old dirty habit. But the other thing, of course, is that in the past, the availability of non-animal foods was sparse. Now it isn't. There's no excuse. I mean, we've got vegan bacon, vegan shrimp, vegan <laughs> cheeses, you name it. There's vegan caviar. There's anything you could possibly want if you just can be bothered to look for it. And sometimes you don't have to be bothered to go too far. But the other thing is, of course, out of sight is out of mind. And if you can't see it, you may not even think about the cruelty, the environmental devastation, the health consequences. You just see something tasty and you just eat it. So I think those are all barriers to change that are coming down, luckily. There are a tremendous number of plant-based alternatives uh, to existing animal-based food products available. The rise of Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat have brought about a really interesting opportunity in, in really the whole sector. And you've been really looking at the, you know, this industry for or these industries for the last few years. Why do you think that now the greater public is starting to look into plant-based options? And, and I'm going off of a statistic that, that showed that 95% of the Beyond Meat customers were actually identified as meat eaters. Um, so do you think that we are in a time, a, a special time now, or have you seen kind of 
uh, upswings or waves like this in the past? Oh, no, this is a special time and lots of factors, I think, come into play. We are in a time of low health, diabetes, heart attack, stroke, high blood pressure, you name it, all sorts of cancers that are linked to meat and dairy consumption. It's not just meat, of course, it is also dairy. Uh, they're high fat, high cholesterol, they clog your arteries and so on. So more physicians, even though they don't get almost any uh, nutrition training in medical school, have cottoned on to the idea because there have been so many research studies that you need to step away from meat and dairy. And so the marketplace is always attuned to those things. I noticed first with soy and almond and the other milks, I mean, the aisles of those are so huge now, but there was a time when you had to mix it yourself with a powder at home. <laughs> and then there was one kind of soy milk and it might've tasted a bit chalky. And now of course it's everywhere. That's because I think people are going to their doctor and their doctor is saying, you need to change your diet. So a lot of people are. And then again, you've got households where young people are growing up not wanting to contribute to cruelty to animals or environmental devastation. And they don't want their parents necessarily to have these diseases that they're seeing. And they, like young people always, are leading the family into a new way of eating. And of course, the companies cotton on to all this and they are providing the products. So you find they're unmissable. There they are. The samples are given out, ads are on TV and on the internet. And it's there in front of you, whereas before you had to really look a bit to find it. A friend of mine, when he became vegan, I think he said that he had to go to, I think, three different doctors before the third one finally said that, yeah, being vegan is actually healthier. <laughs> so I think <laughs> it, it is true that the doctors now are, um, are, are starting to be more attuned to what is actually healthier for you as well. So shifting gears to cell-based meat, cultured meat, clean meat, lab-grown meat. This could potentially allow us to continue eating meat and the types of foods that are derived from animal agriculture, but without slaughter. What are your thoughts on these cell-based meats, and do you think that this would be a good potential path forward? Oh, it's a fantastic path forward. People don't realize, but I actually got Peter involved in this about 22 years ago before anybody had even heard about it. I read a teeny little blurb in the New Scientist that talked about a Professor von Eland in Holland who had had a dream. He'd been in World War II and his dream was to stop violence. He was a meat eater and he just hoped and dreamt that one day you could have that taste you could have real meat, but not harm animals and not contribute to the violence of the slaughterhouse. So we got in touch with him. And over the years, we have funded bits and pieces, a professor in North Carolina, a lab in the Midwest, to come up with the, the little components that together now are helping um, Memphis Meats and all these other places come up with in vitro meat. So we've been great supporters from the beginning. I think that if you really are the sort of person who can't imagine changing away from real meat, you just have to have flesh, actual flesh, then in vitro flesh, of course, will come with no slaughterhouse, no adrenaline in it that the animals have because of the great fear that they have, the awful fear of the slaughter before they actually uh, are subjected to it, won't come without the transport and all the environmental costs and won't come without the all the manure that's going into the rivers and streams and so on. You'll still be able to eat that thing you crave for some reason um, and know it's real, but it will have wiped out all the suffering that goes into real meat today. 
Now, maybe not regularly, but would you eat cell-based meat if it were available today? I have no interest in it whatsoever. Um, if someone said, I will only become a vegan if you eat uh, cell-based meat, I'd eat it. Um, that it just doesn't interest me. I think it's for those dyed in the wool, hold out, stick in the mud people who are going to be at the end of the line. The research and development phase for cell-based meats may require biopsies from host animals or the initial cells that will be used. What is PETA's stance on this type of research? In the end, I believe, of course, it will be um, a mushroom or similar-based serum, not cough serum, that's used. In the end, there'll be a cell line that doesn't have to depend on getting new cells from living animals, from living tissue. But in this stage, anything that's just one little biopsy, even a big biopsy, or taking living cells from living cows or chickens or fishes um, is better than the enormity of the pain and the fear and the misery that real animals go through in order to produce a steak or a nugget or a fish fillet. So we're not purists. We would rather none of this happened. We would rather you could just wave a magic wand and there it was and no pain and suffering was involved. But um, when you look at the end of it is going to mean the end of such enormous quantities of pain and suffering, then sure, go for it. Aside from switching to a plant-based diet and avoiding animal-derived goods, what are some things that someone can do to relieve animal suffering in the world? Well, the, I think the most important thing is to educate others. It's not good enough to just doing it yourself. Of course, you need to do everything you possibly can, and we learn more and more each day of what we can do to not make unkind choices when we buy something or we entertain ourselves. So making sure that we don't eat them or wear them or disrespect them or all these things are vital, but then passing that on to others so that this movement of vegan in all things grows. And one of the things I suggest is feed other people, give them vegan products, cook for them, take them to a vegan meal, for example, um, so that they get to taste something they might not ordinarily have chosen for themselves, and they might like it. Give vegan cookbooks and vegan cruelty-free cosmetics and toiletries and soaps and things to people as gifts. If somebody asks you, what would you like for your birthday, for example, if they already are vegan, that's one thing. If they're not, I would suggest, say, I'd like you to go vegan for three weeks for me, or vegan for one week if you don't know me well enough. <laughs> and what happens, I have found, and I hear these stories back, is that people who do that, um, they like it. They've tried something new. They often stick with it. Somebody in our office has an Airbnb that they rent out. And they put vegan starter kits and vegan toiletries and so on and vegan uh, books on the shelf. But they also um, have said to people, I will cat sit for you or I will give you a day free if you go vegan for a set period of time. And people try it. They like it and they often stick with it. I think that so it's definitely not vegan, but we're seeing a lot of new products that are coming um, from insect proteins like cricket flowers and different things like that. What are your thoughts on these type of food products? We're learning so much about insects now. I mean, we've always looked down our noses at them because they're so small and because we think of them as pests often. And at PETA, we have kind ways that you can get rid of insects you don't want in your home, for example and cruelty-free, not tested on animals, no animal ingredients, mosquito repellent, things like that. But really, how desperate must a person be to decide I've got to kill animals, even small ones by the thousands, in order to have a burger? 
We don't need this kind of stuff. There is so much incidental killing in the manufacture of food. We don't need to purposely set out. It's like the business of, oh, well, we're, we, we are kind of bored with having cows and chickens and pigs and lambs and turkeys and ducks to eat. So we're going to eat crocodile fritters. You know, you go to an, a place and they'll have alligator fritters on the menu or emu or ostrich or looking for something more exotic, the sort of um, Anthony Bourdain mindset that all living beings are here for us to consume, you know, as if we're sort of Pac-Man creatures. We're not. I mean, we can be kind. We can be decent. We can do as little harm as possible. Of the l latest gen, uh, next-gen food products that have been re released, such as Impossible Burger or Beyond Meat, uh, which ones are your favorite? Oh, I love food, and I like <laughs> most foods. Uh, it's almost impossible to find one I don't like, um, but Beyond has such an extraordinary range. And, of course, it's not tested on animals either, which is lovely. I do love everything Gardein, especially the fish fillet. I'm English, so I like fish and chips, and Gardein has a fantastic... Uh, uh, vegan fish and good catch has just come out with tuna which i make an open-faced tuna sandwich with with olives and a either daya cheese or, or a miyoko cheese on top and grill it i think those are all fantastic and there are many more now now i'm starting to get hungry so may, maybe i'll try to find those uh those uh fish fillets <laughs> <laughs> so i I was doing a little bit of research, and I believe that you have an upcoming book. Is that right? I do. It's called Animal Kind. It's going to be out January the 7th, Simon and & Schuster. And the whole premise is that animals are remarkable. They have remarkable abilities and talents and intelligence and ways of communicating with each other. And every day there seems to be something new we learn about how awe-inspiring animals are. And so now that we have this knowledge, as we're increasing this knowledge, what can we do that will allow us to be more respectful and compassionate toward them? What habits can we change? What exciting new products are coming on the market that will allow us to leave animals in peace? What is the best way to get information about that book? Uh, you can pre-order it on Amazon, um, and there should be something coming up soon on the PETA website and in our magazine. But uh, Animal Kind, look at it, uh, look for it under my name, Ingrid Newkirk, on Amazon.com. I have one question that is really kind of like a, a personal question that I'd like to ask. I studied advertising in school, and a lot of times we would reference the work that comes out of PETA as as examples of, of impactful advertising. So maybe can you tell us a little bit about when PETA is working on a new campaign? What is that process like from a creative standpoint? We brainstorm a lot and we look at ideas, we look at slogans, we look at puns, we look at what's in the press. And we do try to piggyback on things. For example, Popeye's as a chicken sandwich campaign going on now. And we're about to release something um, that shows chickens on a factory farm with their eyes popped out. And it's really revolting, but if people are drooling over the fact that they're going to eat a factory farmed chicken sandwich, maybe they should think of Popeye in a different way. I really hope we do get closer to advancing cell cultured meat so <laughs> wow <laughs> you can learn more about ingrid newkirk and PETA at www.peta.org uh, ingrid are there any last insights that you might have for our listeners today well thank you alex for asking that question because i always say to people you mustn't undersell yourself you are so powerful you live in a free country we all have our voices our hands to hand things out to people, to stick vegan starter kits in the back of airline seat pockets and leave them at the gym. 
We have our social media that we can use to spread the word, to send videos around to others. We are so powerful and companies are looking at us and listening to us. So we need to tell them why we won't buy, what we won't buy, and why we are buying what we're buying and demand it of store managers, fill out coupons, write TV shows, just make our voices heard so that when we go to our maker or we end our lives somehow, we can look back and think, I did everything I could to make the world the way I wanted it to be. What's in a vegan starter kit? Oh, a vegan starter kit is actually a magazine. Oh, okay. And it has tips and it has recipes and it has reasons to go vegan. Okay, cool. I will definitely check it out. Ingrid, thank you so much for being with us today on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. Thank you very much for having the show. This is your host, Alex, and we look forward to being with you on our next episode.